Conservation Ballad is working under the uh, mentorship of the late Nabja Sodi. And it was there, I think, that uh, Singley developed his keen interest in using both uh, modeling methods and empirical field studies to understand threats to biodiversity, particularly in Southeast Asia, as well as broad biogeographic patterns of uh, species occurrence and species discovery. Singley came to Princeton uh, for his doctoral work in environment ecology and evolutionary biology, where he focused on the conservation and ecology of freshwater fishes in Southeast Asia, uh, picking an area that is undergoing uh, a tremendous amount of land use change and focusing on a diverse group of species, freshwater fish, that had heretofore been virtually unstudied in the context of all of these land use changes. Upon finishing his dissertation uh, last summer, he joined uh, Julian Olden's lab at the University of Washington as a postdoctoral researcher, where he has turned his attention to uh, large database analyses of freshwater fish in North America, while also retaining a keen interest in conservation issues in Southeast Asia. It's a real pleasure to welcome him back here this afternoon, where he will be talking on the question, can oil palm plantations be singly deal?
So we know now that body pump is replacing photons, resulting in terrestrial biodiversity loss. And we know that the trend is unlikely to abate, owing to increasing demand for palm oil. But what we know less about is the impacts of oil palm on aquatic biodiversity. And is it possible to make oil palms greener? That is, to be better at maintaining biodiversity. And what are the implications for our empirical research for current sustainability standards? So the outline of my talk will be, first I will present a study that elucidates the impact of oil palm agriculture on aquatic biodiversity and the effectiveness of a common mitigation strategy Riparian buffers, which is retaining forests around streams. Second, many sustainability standards call for the retention of forest patches, be it riparian forest patches as well as non-riparian forest patches. And then I review, so I review existing studies to assess if this approach actually works for biodiversity conservation. Third, we know that science can inform management regimes of growers and plantations. But it would be also more useful if we also study ways to drive growers to actually adopt these mitigation strategies. In, so in the, third, in, in the third part of my talk, I assess consumer attitudes towards sustainable power. So it's, so it's to better inform ways in which the conservation community can actually uh, drive growers into adopting some of these uh, greener practices. So hopefully by kind of doing this uh, like employees free from approach we can uh, get greener power. So the, the, my first question and study is that can riparian reserves mitigate oil palm impacts on fish? So I did this as uh, part of my doctoral dissertation here with David. Uh, it recently been published so uh, I'll take a look at it. So we know so this study focuses on um, insular Southeast Asia or what we commonly call Sunderland. So among major tropical regions, Southeast Asia has the highest rate of deforestation and it's higher than even the Amazon or in Western Africa for the year 2000 to 2010. As of 2010, less than 50% of the original lowland forests in Southeast Asia remain. It's important because it's a hot spot for freshwater biodiversity. It's the largest number of freshwater fish families among all tropical regions. And Four of the six most fish-fish basins after I control for basin area can be found in Southeast Asia. So Southeast Asia is extremely rich in terms of freshwater fish biodiversity. <coughs> the problem is that the biodiversity rich lowlands of Southeast Asia are being converted to oil palm plantations. And there's a reduction in the complexity, structural complexity, as well as kind of the general more open canopy cover in the soil gets drier, and all these associated impacts. So a prominent wildlife friendly strategy is to actually retain forest fragments around streams and also um, in areas that uh, with no streams. However, not all plantations actually adopt this strategy. So here I want to focus on examining the impact of oil palm on fish as well as the conservation value of riparian reserves. Both are topics that have never been explored till now. To do that, I did a few studies to measure biodiversity values in streams within riparian reserves and in those lacking riparian reserves in an oil palm plantation. So the biodiversity values that I measured was local species richness, which is like the average number of species found in a particular stretch of a stream, total species richness, the total number of species found after taking you know, into account all the streams within a certain habitat type in the oil palm and also we get biomass, community composition of the species, as well as functional diversity. So this is my study site. I sampled fish in June 2013 in the dry season, just so that the water is low enough for me to wade in and do electrofishing. fishing. I sampled in 12 independent tributaries. All 12 tributaries are in an oil palm plantation, so it's in an oil palm monoculture landscape. The orange sites are oil palm streams with no regular <coughs> reserve, I call them oil palm OG sites. And then there are two different types of streams with different types of riparian reserve. The only difference is that the light green ones, they've got riparian reserves comprising community forest, right, uh, comprising community forest, which means 
the forests are being actively used by local communities for logging as well as for the cultivation of understory crops for subsistence. And the second type of riparian reserve is a selectively logged forest riparian reserve, which means that the forest has been logged maybe 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, and now it's in the, now it's in the process of uh, regeneration. So streams are all weightable, they are under one meter deep, they are all small second and third order streams, and I sample the total of 100 meters for each stream. So I sample a fish using three methods, electrofishing, push netting, and sail netting, and this would ensure that I get a comprehensive uh, fish community. Because these three methods allow me to target different habitats and make sure that I don't miss any fish in any habitat. I recorded each stream environmental variables, and I also characterized forest cover immediately adjacent and upstream of the sampling site. So these are the pictures of the sites. Um, so this is the oil pond site without buffers. You can see that no forest have been retained. Um, the growers have planted oil palm right to the edge. But because they realize that it's against national laws, so now they are kind of allowing uh, the undergrowth to swamp the oil palm. But then there's no forest. And then in the top forest side, the green forest side, they kind of look like there's like secondary or not forest directly surrounding the streams. And then there's another type of site that I use as a comparison. It's a pre-conversion forested landscape. Streams within uh, like continuous forest that was sampled in 1976 by Tyson Roberts. So this was when uh, Kalimantan was more or less forested with um, secondary forest, log forest, as well as some kind of rubber in trees. So before um, forests were converted to oil palm. So we have data from that. So what do we find? So this is a graph of species richness against beef, and these dots represent the values of species richness for each site. The purple dots represent the continuous control forest sites. These have been, these are the number of species in streams pre-conversion. And then we've got the two riparian reserve sites, the light green and the dark green. So light green is community forest riparian reserve, and dark green is not forest riparian reserve and the uh, um, orange open circles are oil palm sites. So we see a general increase of species richness with width, which is expected, the species area relationship. But after accounting for that, we see a difference between the first three categories versus the last category. So the best supported model using multi-model inference revealed that species, species richness in forests is the same as that in community forests riparian reserve, the same as that in not forest riparian reserves, but species richness is different, of all these three groups are different from oil palm. The width of the stream. Yeah, the 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 wet width. So next we look at total fish biomass, we find the same result. We see that uh, oil palm sites have got Lower, they support a lower field biomass than the forested sites. So for this particular analysis, um, width doesn't come out in the best model, so we just showed it as um, that without accounting for width. But even after accounting for width, we see the same effect. It's just that it's not as well supported as this uh, model. So yeah, log forest, the same as community forest riparian reserve, and it's, uh, have more species richness compared to the other. So next, we want to find the mechanisms by which uh, uh, that control fish species in these streams. So we, so we uh, just correlated different environmental variables with fish mm -hmm. And the two best models are the, uh, the, the models consisting of the total leaf litter cover. As leaf cover increases in the stream increases, Fish species richness increase. So these are the dots, the same. So the oil palm sites, uh, forest sites, and this is the mean. And this is the 95% credible intervals, or no, sorry, 95% prediction intervals. And then substrate size also plays a part in driving species richness. So as substrate size increases, as it increases from silt or mud. 
to sand and gravel to get more species as well. So other variables are also important, but not as important as uh, these two variables. We have conductivity, very important. We have uh, dissolved nitrate concentration as nitrates, uh, as, sorry, as nitrates go up, the number of species increases, goes down. As canopy cover increases, the number of species in increases. So the, the variables that were not correlated were water pH, water velocity, root cover, uh, much wood debris, dissolved oxygen, and the concentration of iron in the water. So here I wanted to find out if riparian land use actually drives species richness via the in-stream variables that we have explored before. So I fitted some <coughs> equation models to infer, uh, to infer causative relationships. So we find that the presence of riparian reserves drives an <coughs> increase in the total leaf with the carbon, which makes sense because when you have forests, what happens is that the leaf, uh, the senesce leaf will drop into the streams and creates like a uh, little cover which acts as a, micro, mi a possible microhabitat for fishes. And the riparian reserves, the presence of riparian reserve also increases substrate size, which means that it probably decreases siltation and sedimentation. And next, the amount of literally little cover then increases species richness. You can see from here, little cover goes up, species richness goes up, <coughs> surface size goes up, species richness goes up, yeah. and these are the controlling for stream use. So all the R squares are rather high. Um, our sample sizes are low, but the R squares are high, so I, yeah, I think this relationship is real. So to conclude, primary reserves in increase both these little inputs and minimizes sedimentation, therefore increases substrate size, and this increases species richness. However, after accounting for leaf litter and substrate, there's no direct effect of, we, we did not find a direct effect of uh, riparian reserve on richness. So that just says that these two mainstream variables are the dominant variables that drive uh, the richness patterns of fish in our species. So next, we want to ask, is the presence of buffers or is, the, is it the amount of forest in the overall landscape that really matters? So we know that we have forest that's pretty close to the stream, but we also have forest that's further away. We're going to find out the landscape effects of such forest. So the strategy is to correlate species richness with forest cover at different spatial scales. So this is a stream, and this is a, my 100 meter sampling site, and I characterize forest at the site scale, adjacent to 100 meter sampling site, and I use and I uh, by using a satellite image, I could calculate the amount of forest that's in a 10 meter wide riparian zone, 25 meter wide riparian zone, 50 meter wide zone, 100 meter wide zone, and 200 meter wide zone. So I get values of forest cover <coughs> in all these different spatial scales. Next, I go up to the meso scale, which I define as adjacent to one kilometer upstream. So if this is my current meter sampling site, this whole stream is one kilometer upstream, goes up. So I did the same. Like I, uh, I, I calculated forest cover for 10, for in, in the riparian zones, 10 meters, 25, 50, 100, and 200 meter wide. So I get like the percent forest cover for each of these, at, at, at each of these scales. So what did I find? I find that Forest cover nearest to the stream and directly adjacent to the second side is most important. If we look at the R squares as explained by the model, forest cover at the 10 meter wide zone directly adjacent to where I sample has the greatest explanatory power. And then if we look at all the side scale, uh, uh, the, the side scale variance explained is almost always higher than the meso scale. And within the meso scale, which is a one kilometer upstream, kind of spatial scale, the 10 meter wide zone is again, is again more important than uh, wider regularly. So next, I find that, I found that uh, for total species richness, if I total up the number of species accumulated across the different sites, we find that there are more species in community forest riparian reserves and not forest riparian reserves, and they are almost the same and they are both higher than that in oil pump. So 
when we look at community composition, so we have got the solid symbols, they are riparian reserve streams, the open set, the open symbols are oil palm streams. We find that okay, so this is a MMDS plot, which which plots, uh, which is like a uh, which represents the community composition of a particular site. So each dots that are nearer to each other will have similar number, we have similar types or identities of species. So here we can see that all the black dots are very close to one another and they are far away from the circle dots. We show that these two sites, the riparian reserve sites, have similar species identities, species <coughs> uh, similar species communities, whereas the oil palm sites have a different uh, species community. So next, if you look at if you, if you plot this, but instead you plot the, num the, the type of species that are here, we can kind of see um, what species are aligned or have an affinity with these particular sites and which are the species that are common in the oil palm sites. So remember, oil palm sites are in this area and forest sites are in this area. So species, so these are species codes. Species that are in this area would be closer, would, would, would be more common in forest sites, whereas species in this area would be more common in oil palm sites. So you can see these are forest species, we've got syndicate, which is related to the same family as uh, China's in the US. More syndicates. We've got a leaf catfish, which, uh, which basically hides under leaf litter. So, so you can notice the different types of body morphology and the different uh, types of life history strategies that the fish, that the, that, that the different species of fish employ. So this is a uh, uh, we call it we call this a half beak. So it has a extended lower jaw and it fits at, on the surface. So it fits on any insects that kind of just drop in the surface of the water. So it's really different, right? And then this is the new species that we found is a black roach. Uh, apparently, it's been described for two years now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you can so, so so you can see that the species are really different. And then we have more loaches. And a catfish, a miniature catfish. So these are all aligned, or these are all kind of found in uh, sites with riparian reserves. But when we go to the oil palm sites, we see species that are very similar. They have cyprinates, more cyprinates, although they are nice, but at the same time, more cyprinates. So, they, they, so you can see the body structure and the, and the strategies that they use are different. And different types of them. And uh, this is a unit that is named after my old advisor in any yeah. And uh, leaf fish. <coughs> so the last question is, do riparian reserves actually conserve functional diversity? So I evaluated the effect of riparian habitat type on four different functional diversity metrics. So here, these are the four different functional diversity metrics. Functional group richness, functional dispersion, Browse scheme and function evenness. So I wouldn't go into detail of what exactly they measure, but roughly they higher MD, a higher function diversity means greater variation in the life history strategies related to resource acquisition. Meaning there's greater variation in the community in terms of body size, in terms of trophic position, trophic strategy, in terms of schooling behavior, or in terms of uh, the vertical position the fish prefers in the so here we see that for forest, for continuous forest and riparian reserve sites, the functional diversity scores are always higher than that of the oil palm site. This is confirmed by the inference from the best model. And the R squares are decent. So to summarize, um, streams from riparian reserves retain pre-conversion local species richness. So for on average, for a 5 meter wide stream, removal of riparian reserves actually leads to a decline of 42% in local richness of fish. Streams with riparian reserves support higher fish biomass in addition to higher fish richness. And the mechanism for that is that riparian reserves provide new data inputs and minimize sedimentation. Right, retaining forest cover closest to the stream is most important because we find that at a 10 meter scale, forest cover affects fish diversity the most. So if you want to restore lands, yeah, it makes sense to restore as close to the river as possible. 
which communities of riparian reserves are different from non-buffered sites. Riparian reserves retain pre-conversion functional diversity, and functional diversity declines if they are being removed. And you can conclude that like, even narrow riparian reserves can yield big benefits in terms of conserving fish and maybe other aquatic organisms, but it will probably be different from the restaurant. So next, the second part of my talk I'll be talking about is a related part, it's about setting aside forest patches for biodiversity. Does it always work? So remnant patches, forest patches, is not a new conservation strategy. Um, for many countries like Brazil or Indonesia or Malaysia, they require laws for landowners or plantation <coughs> growers to retain a certain amount of intact forest on their lands. Like I think for example in Brazil, each land only is supposed to retain 50 meters of riparian reserve or 30 meters of riparian reserve with in addition to 25% of forest within their land owners. Although I think recent laws may have wanted to reduce that. In Indonesia it's important because there's a there's a presidential decree that says that uh, land owners has to have to uh, conserve a 50 meter wide riparian buffer around small rivers and 100 meter wide around large rivers. And this is exactly the laws that are needed for oil plan for oil plantation to be certified as sustainable. So the main certification agency is RSPO, the Round Table for Sustainable Palm Oil. So for a plantation that needs that wants to be certified, it needs to follow existing law, which includes the law that I just mentioned, retaining my parent reserves. And the plantations also need to conserve forest patches if they are classified as having high conservation values. However, most are small. So in studies that have studied uh, all these remnant forest patches, most remnant forest patches are around 1 to 100 hectares. And so for comparison, each plantation is about 10,000 to 20,000 hectares. So these patches are really small. So the question is, what is the strength conservation value of retaining all these small forest fragments within oil palm plantations? So I did a systematic search on web of science with these search terms so that I want to target or uh, identify studies that have looked at biodiversity values in fragments. So I looked specifically for studies that recorded species communities in pre-conversion forests versus forest fragments between oil palm plantations versus just oil palm plantations. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in these studies. So after doing the better, after, after, after doing the the review, what I found was actually just four studies, one of which is mine. <laughs> so I can't do a real quantitative uh, review with stats and stuff, so I'll just present like the results of the individual studies. So for fish, we found like a, about a 40% decline if we take the mean, so at mean stream width, there's a 40% decline in the number of species per site. When forest, okay, so, so this is scale. So this, the y-axis, represents the site level species richness and it represents the percentage of continuous forest. So at 100%, so the number of species at continuous forest would always be at 100. So any decline will be relative to that. So here, the, the orange bar shows oil palm, and once forest is converted to oil palm, there's a 40% reduction in fish species. However, if we retain our green reserve, there's only a very small reduction, like almost none reduction for fish at least. How about eggs? So this this study, uh, Claudia Green and colleagues studied eggs and the conservation value of riparian buffers on eggs, and they did it in Malaysia. So what they found is that there's a 61 percent reduction when we convert a continuous forest to oil farm. However, in riparian reserves, the reduction was only 2.5%. Pretty good. Next, Claudia Gray in another study showed that for dung beetles, there's 82% reduction. Right? When you remove a forest, like 8 out of 10 species will be lost per site. However, in riparian reserves, only 20% lost. So riparian reserves seem to be pretty good. The last study was by David Edwards and uh, David Wilco, and they, 
and they studied patches, forest patches that are not in riparian areas. So these are patches of forest that are that were retained uh, to conserve wildlife. But what they found was different. There's a 54% reduction in species richness when continuous forest is converted to oil plants. But when we look at the patches, there's an almost equivalent reduction in species. So here we show that not all for pregnant forests are equal, they are really different. For riparian reasons, they seem to work well for fish and ants and somewhat well for plant beetles. But when we conserve small patches of forest away from riparian zones, they don't seem to work as well. So setting aside forest patches within plantations for conservation works better for some groups than others. So more effective for seem to be more effective for riparian and street biodiversity at least from the four studies that I got. Uh, few, few studies have uh, investigated biodiversity within different sized forest patches, within uh, versus continuous forests. So these studies involving ants and bats show that patches below about 50 to 100 hectares they support very little biodiversity. So what does that mean for policy? Previous studies have called for the conversion of small patches. So they are so uh, folks like David Edwards and others have been saying, okay, why not just convert all these small patches of forest and not, not conserve them at all, since they are not going to have much biodiversity value. And perhaps pay and offset to conserve and increase the area somewhere else in a large, like near a large piece of forest so that we can like conserve even patches of forest elsewhere. So this is also called land sparing in the mechanisms for biobanking. However, the problem is that it's not straightforward not straightforward because from my experience by talking to people, local people often claim customary or use rights. And most of the time the plantations they are saying that they are conserving it for biodiversity, but actually it's because they can't reach an agreement with the local people regarding the conversion of these forests. So if the conservation community calls for the calls for the the, the conversion of these uh, small pieces of forest, it could create some kind of uh, conflict between uh, Further conflict between local people and plantation companies. So it's not straightforward. So uh, the third part of the talk would be can we actually save forests and biodiversity by knowing what we consume? So we know that science can inform optimal optimal strategies for conserving biodiversity. So the challenge now is how do we encourage growers to adopt such policies or such practices? So we've done a lot of science, but science means nothing if the growers are not going to like, follow our recommendations. So a possible strategy, I think, is sustainability labeling. It could drive demand for greener practices among growers. The problem with that is, after talking to oil palm plantation owners and manufacturers, a lot of them have said that they are afraid to even use palm oil as an ingredient. And other manufacturers that do use sustainable palm oil, and we know a lot of them do that, Unilever and yeah, and uh, Gucci uses the sustainable palm oil as well. They, they, they do not display the sustainability label on their products. And consumers have negative attitudes, and, and this because consumers have negative attitudes towards palm oil. So, we need to better understand consumer knowledge and attitudes towards conventional and sustainable palm oil. Uh, I conducted consumer surveys in Singapore. So Singapore is a high income city state in Asia. Um, therefore, our study is slightly reflective of major consumers of products containing palm oil, namely the consumers in the West, as well as the increasingly affluent middle class in emerging economies like China and India. So what we did was that we Perform consumer surveys at the exit of grocery stores. We we went there at both peak and non-peak hours. We went to a range of neighborhoods, different so we could reach out to consumers of different uh, different social economic uh, levels. We approached potential respondents without describing the subject of the survey to minimize uh, self-selection bias. So first, we asked each respondent if they bought. Margarine, chocolate bars, cookies, <coughs> moisturizers, potato chips, and soap. So these are all the products that are known to uh, contain palm oil. 
So if so, they are considered as, we call them as consumers and they are asked questions about the knowledge of whether they know if these products will contain alcohol, what are their attitudes towards sustainable versus unsustainable versus how long with no indication of sustainability. And what is their willingness to pay for products containing sustainable alcohol? So here we found that knowledge of the product, that a product contains palm oil or not varies from the product. So for chocolate, margarine, and so they are all different. So grey shows you the percentage or the proportion of consumers that actually answer correctly that each product contains palm oil. And then white would be the consumers that they don't know. So a sizable proportion of people basically are unaware that products can actually contain palm oil. So next, we're going to find out, we ask consumers who were unaware. So unaware meaning they answered, oh, I did not know that this product contains palm oil, or I am sure that this product does not contain palm oil. So these unaware consumers, we ask them whether products, con whether they were less or more likely to buy a product containing palm oil, if, if they know that it contains palm oil. So we ask whether they were likely to buy a product if they know that it contains palm oil. We did not tell them what palm oil was about, how sustainable is it? Like we just wanted to find out about their inherent biases about palm oil. So the white bar show you the proportion of consumers that say that they are much less likely or less likely to buy a product than palm oil. So about um, so a minority of them say that oh if I know that it contains palm oil, I would not buy a product. So next we say how about products containing unsustainable palm oil? We explain to them that unsustainable palm oil means products that are made from palm oil that's derived from plantations that have replaced tropical forests and the replacement of tropical forests have resulted in a decline in biodiversity. So that's how we kind of define what is unsustainable palm oil. So after knowing that, a lot of them, or a high, much higher proportion of them, or majority of them now, all say that they are less likely to buy this product if they know that the product is unsustainable. So, this is just descriptive, but we also did a statistical test using a Monte Carlo pet differences test. And we show that <coughs> within a person, before and after we tell them that palm oil is unsustainable, there's a difference. They are less likely to buy it. Next, we ask all consumers whether they, are, they were willing to pay more for sustainable palm oil. And if so, if they are willing to pay more, how much more? So most say that they were willing to pay more to buy a product containing sustainable palm oil. And among these people who say yes, they were willing, they were generally willing to pay about 12 to 15 percent more for products containing sustainable palm oil. Next, we're going to find out if demographic variables and pro-environmental attitudes affect their willingness to pay and the amount they're willing to pay and how much they're willing to pay. So the main drivers, okay, so A, so this part shows you Choose the variables predicting whether they were willing to pay or not. It's a binary thing, whether they are willing to pay or not. Females are more willing to pay. It's awesome. Um, consumers with terrestrial with, with tertiary or higher education, meaning consumers who have attended university, um, are basically more say that they're more willing to pay. There's a correlation between education and income, but we didn't include income in the model because like many consumers didn't want to review their income but we could infer that there's a kind of like, interconnection like, higher education means higher income at the same time means more knowledge about palm oil as well as uh, more disposable income to kind of pay for uh, to, to, to pay a few today we look at uh, the magnitude of the premium so among, custom, among consumers who wanted to pay a premium, we want to know what affects the, 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 the amount they say they are So again, education came up. So uh, consumers with tertiary or higher education basically indicated higher premium. So again, this was probably a relation, it's a complex relation between education, income, and the amount of were So all these variables were in subordinate models that have some support but are less important. Interestingly, uh, 
pro environmental attitudes like reasons of damage and anti human essentialism didn't really come up with the best model. So, to summarize, a sizable proportion of consumers were unaware that common palm oil containing products may in fact contain harm. However, contrary to what manufacturers and palm oil growers believe, there's little bias against palm oil. So, a minority of people say that they were unwilling to buy products after they were. However, these consumers have negative attitudes when informed that product contains unsustainably harvested palm oil. So, here the difference is like you can get the knowledge. Consumers are willing to pay more if they know products contain sustainable palm oil. So now the price premium for RSPO Green Palm certificates is 0.3 percent. So by basically it costs less than one percent more for a manufacturer to purchase this sustainability certificate from uh, RSPO. However. We show that the willingness to pay, the average willingness to pay for consumers is about 12 to 15 percent. So there's a there's a gap here, right? It shows that there's an incentive for product manufacturers to use sustainably harvested palm oil or at least support its production through pure palm oil. So the, the, the whole sustainability scheme of palm oil is a bit complex. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to discuss more about this with, with people after that. After this, but yeah. So but here generally we show that there's an incentive for manufacturers to use sustainable palm oil and there's a and, and, and they can actually profit from it. So to summarize the what I found for the three parts, we now know what works. Forests among streams or along streams should be maintained. It benefits fishes, riparian ants and riparian duck birds. Patches of forests not along streams, especially really small patches does not seem to benefit birds, butterflies, ants, etc. However, to kind of decide whether to convert these pieces of small patches of forest we have to take into account customary rights of local people. And targeting consumers may help drive demand for greener practices. We found that there was no bias against people. Um, and there was a positive attitude towards sustainable palm oil. So that we encourage manufacturers to use sustainable palm oil and display labels. And education can pay and target certain consumer profiles. So male consumers and consumers without tertiary education that we identify as people who are less willing to pay more. So NGOs or manufacturers if they want to look at this sector of consumers. So now certification standards this caveat, they're not perfect for sure. So I think David and other people have raised points about how green labeling can be misused. They're not perfect but they are at least better than conventional um, oil palm oil culture. So hopefully the demand of consumers can drive more stringent standards and therefore improve uh, to uh, help, help help to drive greener practices in oil palm oil culture. So with that I end my talk and thanks everyone for coming and listening.
So, so the marginal cost for the cheapest way of the, the cheapest form of sustainable sustainable palm oil or sustainability labeling is 0.2%. That's the lowest marginal cost. And this particular program is where by um, manufacturers of products they can buy certificates from RSPO and these certificates, this 0.6% would actually go to manufacturers who actually uh, are actually certified. So it's just a method of basically encouraging sustainable practices. And manufacturers can still use the label on their product, but it's a different label. So if you have bought Girl Scout cookies, I know it's Girl Scout cookies season, I bought a lot. Um, and there's a sustainability <coughs> label, there's an RSP label, it says mix. So mix meaning there's a mixture of carbon from everywhere. It's not completely traceable, but they know that the amount that they have saved, so by 3%, have gone on to encourage the production of sustainable carbon. Right? So I, so I guess, like, in actual fact, I think it should be lower than 12 to 15%, but the lowest would be 0 to But again, if you consider the amount of carbon that's in a product, like in cookies, it's 25% or 20% of, of, of the manufacturing cost. This 0.3% immediately becomes 0.1%, it's just a third.
for the amount of energy that it produces, it takes up least. Like it produces, the, it, it, it takes over the least amount of volumes. So the least. So for that amount of uh, energy that's that's produced by the crop, yes, a yes, a higher energy intensity. Most energy per acre. Yeah, most energy per acre. But by the quick question is like I, I I think it's interesting to do some economic modeling to figure out as demand changes what you know what kind of land use replace each other. I mean there have been studies like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I've got, I've got a friend who came out with, last year came out with a study that basically, yeah, it, yeah, it reminds me of a study that says, that tries to figure out how much each country has to pay for global health care. So I guess, like, you know, who is, who, is, who is consuming all this oil and what kind of oil is they're consuming, what's, what's the biodiversity impact on it. You could figure out some kind of compensation. Uh, 
So I guess it's, I, I, I think for around blue guns and their, their special schemes, like for instance for sustainable palm oil and this, there's a HCD for around blue guns. If they see around blue guns in the plantation, they're not supposed to uh, uh, convert the forest that around blue guns using. And then there are also different criteria that states that for patches that are above, like a big patch of forest where around blue guns or uh, or other primates or other big mammals living, they're not supposed to uh, convert the forest as well. So here we are trying to say, look at the fish because no one has looked at it before, and by just changing our practices by a little bit, it could benefit the fish so much. So we uh, will have to stop it here. It's one o'clock, but if you can stay behind in a few minutes, folks can come up and ask you questions. Thank you very much for. Appearing.